Okay, we're going to be talking about blood, lymph, and immunity uh, within the comparative anatomy uh, realm. Our learning objectives today are plentiful. We're going to list and describe the functions of blood, the composition of blood plasma, the characteristics of mature erythrocytes, the structure of the hemoglobin molecule, and explain the fate of hemoglobin following intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. We're going to give the origin of thrombocytes and describe their characteristics and functions, list the types of leukocytes and describe the functions of each, Describe the formation of lymph fluid and its circulation through the lymphatic system and the functions of that lymphatic system. We're also going to describe the structure and functions of the lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, tonsils, and galt. That's a whole system. Uh, we're going to talk about the functions of the immune system, differentiate between specific and nonspecific immune reactions, and cell-mediated me and humoral immunity, the components involved in both cell mediated immunity and, and humoral immunity and explain the role of each of those components. We're going to list and describe the classes of immunoglobulins and differentiate between active and passive immunity. So lots of stuff to talk about today. First of all, we need to talk about the classification and function of blood. So it is actually classified as connective tissue. Um, the three main functions of blood are to transport regulate and defend the body. It transports oxygen, nutrients, and other essential nutrients like cells or to the cells. Uh, it'll take waste products of cells to waste disposal organisms for excretion from the body. And it's gonna uh, transport hormones from endocrine glands to target organs, white blood cells from the bone marrow to the tissues and platelets to any site of damage in a blood vessel wall. It uh, is a regulatory system, so it aids in the regulation of body temperature, and those regulators are in the brain and are influenced in part by the blood that passes through or over them. It also will regulate tissue fluid content, and that helps to maintain homeostasis. Also blood pH, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. White blood cells are part of the defense system. It, they phagocytize or eat up foreign invaders, and then there are platelets and 13 other clotting factors that are found in blood and that are necessary for the blood to clot. And if any one of those clotting factors is missing, blood will not clot. I want you to look at table 9-1 in your book to review those clotting factor numbers. There are a couple that are really important. Uh, the one that we will talk about later is von Willebrand's factor, and that's factor 8. Uh, and that is a common disorder that we see in dogs. So what makes up blood? Composition of blood is uh, both plasma, the liquid portion, and the cellular portion, which contains red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets or thrombocytes. The plasma portion makes up about 45 to 78% of the blood volume, and it just depends on the species of animals and the size of those red blood cells. Plasma is 93% water with proteins, fibrinogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, lipids, amino acids, and metabolic wastes, and electrolytes. They're all suspended in the solution. Then there's the cellular portion, which contains the red blood cells, which we'll call erythrocytes, platelets, which you'll hear us refer to as thrombocytes, and white blood cells, or leukocytes. White blood cells are further differentiated into granulocytes, which have basically granules in the cytoplasm. Um, and those are eosinophils, which are uh, stain red granules, basophils, which stain blue, those uh, granules are blue, and neutrophils, which are neutral. They don't stain red or blue. Um, we also have agranulocytes. There are no granules in the cytoplasms of lymphos or lymphocytes and monocytes. So whole blood appears red because of the many red blood cells in the plasma. And the serum portion of that whole blood is, the color is dependent on the concentration of the hemoglobin breakdown products in the plasma. So normally hemoglobin is contained within the blood. And very little of it is in the plasma. And the more blood, uh, or blood cells, red blood cells that are broken apart, the more hemoglobin is released and the more yellow color or bilirubin you will actually get in, in the serum. Hemoglobin is the protein in red blood cells that gives them that red color and carries large amounts of oxygen. And when these um, red blood cells are worn out, they have a life cycle, um, they are removed, and then the hemoglobin is broken down and removed. 
Hydration of the patient can also determine plasma color. So if they're dehydrated, concentration of all the products in the plasma, including bilirubin, increase uh, relative to the fluid. So then you, you will also get a yellow plasma. Um, many of the stains that we use are polychromatic um, in that they stain more than one color. Usually basic uh, stains blue and acid stains red. Most are uh, referred to as Wright's stains. It's the person who came up with the stain uh, uh, type of stain that we use. Um, so Wright Geems a stain, um, uh, just a plain old Wright standard Wright stain, those kind of things. Hematopoiesis is the production of all blood cells, and it is constantly occurring, or it should be constantly occurring. Within the fetus or the young animal, um, there, uh, the hematopoiesis that occurs usually in the early fetus, it occurs in the liver and the spleen, and as the fetus develops, bone marrow starts to take over. With a newborn or a juvenile, up to juvenile age, uh, one, one to one and a half, um, the bone marrow is mostly active, and, it, and so it is red bone marrow. As the animal ages, um, they need less high blood cell production rate, so that red bone marrow is converted to yellow bone marrow, which is inactive. The red bone marrow does remain in the ends of the long bones and flat bones, and if the bone marrow is inactivated, again, we'll talk about when that might occur, uh, it will go from a yellow color to a red color because it's becoming more active. So there is a common ancestor to all blood cells. Uh, these are pluripotent stem cells, or PPSCs, and that those are scattered throughout the bone marrow. And so they're, they're the, the mother father of all uh, blood cells, red blood cells and any other blood cells, white blood cells. So for red blood cells, the stimulation for production is due to decreased oxygen levels, uh, um, which is detected as the blood goes through the kidney. When the kidney, uh, with its detectors, uh, re realizes there's not enough oxygen in the blood, it will release a hormone called erythropoietin. And I don't know if you've noticed, but poietin or poesis refers to something that stimulates growth. So erythro means red, so erythropoietin means that it's going to stimulate the growth of red blood cells. And so when it reaches the bone marrow, it stimulates those pluripotent stem cells or PPSCs to develop into red blood cells. Um, they, these PPSCs are self-perpetuating, so when a PPSC is stimulated to begin production, it undergoes mitotic division, and one cell continues to develop into uh, a blood cell, and the other cell goes back into the stem cell pool. So the stem cells are always there, but when they're called into action, they clone themselves and then go back and hang out until there's another uh, stimulation. Other blood cells, uh, there are some other stimuli that cause the PPSC to divide into other types of cells. Um, all blood cells except lymphocytes develop in the bone marrow, and many remain in pools in the bone marrow until they're needed in the blood. Certain pathological conditions will stimulate a massive release of cells, and if it's se severe enough, that's when we get Im immature cells being released. And the way that I um, want you to kind of remember this is, is when we have a significant event like an infection and uh, say that we have you know, a war starting and, and first we're going to send in our experienced soldiers but as the war goes on uh, we need more and more soldiers we're going to start getting younger and younger soldiers there's these immature cells are our child soldiers that are sent into action here's a chart that shows you the stem and how it differentiates into different cells and it's pretty cool um, how this is ha happening. Um, we have the multipotent progenitor, which is the PPSC. Um, it, it is the father mother of all other cells. Uh, it will differentiate into a common myeloid progenitor or a com common lymphoid progenitor. And this lymphoid progenitor will further differentiate until it's a B lymphocyte or a T lymphocyte, and a B lymphocyte will turn into a plasma cell. Uh, so that's the common lymphoid progenitor. Um, the common myeloid progenitor will break up into even more cells. So uh, what we're talking about is a red cell and then all the different strains of white cells that are available for fighting infection, uh, including the platelets. Blood storage. So we, we make these cells and then we need to store them somewhere. 
Um, the spleen is our sponge in which blood is stored when an animal is at rest for use when the animal has a need or an increase uh, for an increase in blood volume or oxygen. Here's a little cartoon that um, kind of shows you a, a little bit of what happens. So um, the brain says, hey, the blood pressure is dropping the heart and, and the heart says we're losing blood. There's nothing I can do because the heart, all it does, all it is, is a pump. The spleen jumps in and says, stand aside. I always carry a reserve. All I need to do is reroute or the blood reserve back into the system. There, we're back online. And the heart says, spleen is so cool. So spleen is just, or the heart is just a pump, pumping whatever it is in the body. Um, the spleen is that sponge that holds on to things when uh, there is a need. And in this case, the need is the body is, uh, is under attack. All right, let's talk about red blood cells. Uh, this shows a picture of reticulocyte maturation. Reticulocytes are baby red blood cells. So these reticulocytes, how they look when we look at a stained uh, sample, they kind of look like white blood cells. And very often reticulocytes, when you put them through a, um, an automatic cell counter, will count at, towards the white blood cells. So it's important that we look at a slide to really see what are those uh, cells that, that are being counted. So here is the, um, the blood cell. It needs to lose its nucleus to become mature. Um, and so here is the mature red blood cell. Erythropoiesis is red blood cell production. An immature red blood cell is large with a dark blue cytoplasm and a large round nucleus. Kind of looks like I said, like a, a white cell. As it matures, the nucleus becomes pycnotic, which means it's be it's becoming smaller and denser until it's finally it's pushed out of the cell. The cytoplasm stains blue or basic because of the all the metabolic processes that are occurring in the cell. Protein synthesis begins to produce hemoglobin, which is an acid, and then therefore it stains red in the cytoplasm. So red hemoglobin plus blue cytoplasm leads to lavender cytoplasm or polychromasia. And that's what how we can tell an immature blood cell. Mature red blood cells have decreased blue cytoplasm, so they do appear to be more red because the hemoglobin is uh, acid. Most mammalian red blood cells are biconcave discs with no nucleus and are stained red. But there are different species that have different sized red blood cells with uh, differing degrees of paleness in the center, so a different degree of a central pallor. So some actually are very pale in the center, kind of look like donuts, and others are a little bit more round and, and don't have as much of that central pallor. So for instance, dogs have the largest red blood cell and the largest area of central pallor. Camelids have elliptical or oval red blood cells. Deer red blood cells are sickle-shaped, and in humans, if we see a sickle cell a sickle red blood cell, sickle-shaped red blood cell, that's considered sickle cell anemia because our um, immune system doesn't recognize that as a normal red blood cell, but in deer it is normal. Birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have elliptical and nucleated red blood cells, and they're called heterophils. Uh, they're very interesting uh, looking, and we'll, we'll see those later. Um, there are three functions of a biconcave disc. So why do we have this biconcave disc? The red blood cell membrane is deformable, but it's not elastic. So the cell can take in water and swell in the middle. It gives it room to swell, um, to look like a sphere, and there, therefore it won't rupture, completely rupture the red blood cell. That shape provides more surface area also for diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And that disc um, shape results in a shorter diffusion distance in and out of the cell. So there is a purpose for that biconcave disc. Heme plus globin equals hemoglobin. Heme is made by mitochondria, and it's the pigment portion. Each one of those hemes carries one oxygen molecule, which attaches to iron atoms. So we need iron um, as part of our blood cells as well. Globin is made by ribosomes, and that's the protein portion. So we have the pigmented portion, which carries the oxygen and is attached to iron, and then we have the protein portion. And four heme groups can actually attach to one globulin, globin molecule. So there are different types of hemoglobin as well. Hemoglobin E, which is embryonic, hemoglobin uh, F, which is fetal, and then hemoglobin HB is the adult type of um, hemoglobin. 
The function of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen to tissues, and there are two states in which hemoglobin exi exists. There's oxyhemoglobin, which is associated with iron and has the oxygen, and there's deoxyhemoglobin, which is an empty hemoglobin molecule. There are different factors that influence the ability of hemoglobin to carry oxygen, and that includes pH, temperature, oxygen, and carbon dioxide levels. Um, red blood cell energy, the energy, obviously, they don't have a nucleus, so they don't have, um, uh, they don't have the ability to pr produce energy like our other cells do. Their energy actually comes from glucose, that is those molecules that are just uh, traveling around in the plasma. Um, carbon dioxide transport is a little bit different from oxygen transport. It is uh, directly um, carried uh, or uh, directly um, carried by red blood cells in 25% and indirectly 75% um, by uh, red blood cells. And it's also dissolved in the plasma. So it diffuses into red blood cells and trans is transformed into carbonic acid, then ionizes into hydrogen ions and bicarb. And that's where the acid base balance comes in. Deoxygenated hemoglobin accepts the uh, hydrogen ion and then the bicarb diffuses into the plasma. The bicarb goes into the lungs where it's made into CO2 and water and then the CO2 leaves the system and then again is part of the acid base balance. Um, and the, the, chemist, the chemical equation for that is water plus carbon dioxide, uh, the, mo the plasma or the moisture uh, makes bicarbonate which is then dissolved into hydrogen ions and um, carbonate, uh, carbonic acid. Uh, and it can go back and forth uh, depending on what the needs of, of the body are. So um, to make this a little bit more simple, just remember that carbon dioxide um, is involved in the acid and, and the red blood cells are involved in the acid base balance. So they do have a lifespan and, and they do need to be destroyed at some point. Um, lifespan is really species specific. Dogs, it's about 110 days. For cats, it's 68 days. Um, the process of agents, aging is called senescence. And that's when it loses shape, it kind of becomes rounder, it takes on more fluid, um, uh, but the volume does uh, decrease overall, uh, it becomes smaller. 90% of the destruction of these senescent cells occurs by extravascular hemolysis. So it occurs outside of the uh, vascular system, in the spleen, or in the body tissues. 10% um, of the destruction of the red blood cells is by intravascular hemolysis. So what happens with extravascular hemolysis? Remember, it's in the tissue, so it's macrophages versus monocytes. Uh, macrophages are the white blood cells that are in the tissue. They remove the cells from circulation and break them up. Red blood cell breaks into heme, the heme group, and the globin. The, uh, the heme group, group has the iron on it, and the glob globin or uh, globin has amino acids. The iron goes back into the red bone marrow, and the amino acids are recycled into protein in the liver. The heme is disassembled and eliminated, so it's a whole recycling center. Uh, the heme is converted into bilirubin, which is carried by albumin to the liver. Albumin is a, is a serum protein, and it can be either unconjugated, or it, it, at this point, it's unconjugated or considered free bilirubin, so it's not connected to the heme. Um, within the liver, it is conjugated into glucuronic acid, and that conjugated bilirubin is secreted as bile in, in the intestines. Uh, it's converted into urobilinogen and, and can be excreted in the urine as urobilin, which adds color, the yellow color to the urine. Um, it can also give, be excreted in stool as stercobilin, which adds color to the stool. So if you think about the color which is within our body, most of it comes from the heme uh, group. Uh, and so it's important to remember that because when we see an increase in color in the serum or in the urine, it could be an indication that we have red blood cells that are being broken down. Intravascular hemolysis occurs by destruction within the blood vessels. Remember, this is just 10% of, of hemolysis. Um, it is uh, related to metabolic and mechanical stresses in circulation. Um, because that results in red blood cell fragmentation, fragmentation or destruction. Membranes rupture and hemoglobin is released into the blood. This unconjugated hemoglobin, it's not connected to anything, is picked up by something called 
hemoglobin. And it and that is just a transport protein that is taken to the macrophages in the liver for further breakdown, which then goes into extravascular hemolysis. And then we get our urobilinogen and we get our stercobilinogen um, and, you know, the yellow color to the plasma, the urine, and a little bit of yellow added to our stool. Um, hemoglobinemia will occur if the hapt haptoglobin is already filled with hemoglobin. Uh, so they can't pick up that excess unconjugated hemoglobin. So if there's too much hemoglobin running around in the blood, it becomes stuck in the plasma because it can't get into the liver. There's only so much haptoglobin available to carry it. Um, and that's when you're going to see a red serum. So if we have hemolys hemolysis happening within the serum, that can be either due to um, a technical error when you're taking blood, if you're taking it with too small of a needle, or you're taking it too quickly and it ruptures those red blood cells, that can lead to a red serum. But there's also a process uh, 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 when the animal gets sick that can lead to this as well. So it's really important in this case that you're very good at, at getting a nice stick uh, with the, when you're taking blood and you're not causing this hemolysis. Um, hemoglobinuria will happen when there's excess hemoglobin in the plasma, which gets into the urine, and that, again, will change the color of the urine as well. Here's a picture diagram of what happens with extravascular hemolysis and intravascular hemolysis. This is, again, in the tissue. This is within the red blood cell um, circulate or within the circulation. Anemia and polycythemia. Anemia is a pathological condition resulting in decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So it can be that we have normal numbers of red blood cell or we can have low numbers of red blood cells. Um, the causes of anemia, anemia can be, like I said, low number of circulating mature red blood cells but because the less mature they are, the less able they are to carry oxygen. Uh, so that could be due to blood loss, blood destruction, decreased red blood cell production. Hemorrhage, red blood cell parasites, radiation therapy, and cancer can cause this low number of circulating mature red blood cells. Or we can have not enough hemoglobin produced for the normal numbers of red blood cells because there may not be enough of one of the substances needed to make it. Iron is one of the substances needed to make hemoglobin. So in iron deficiency anemia, we will have smaller red blood cells because they're trying to incorporate as much hemoglobin um, as they can, as will fit their volume, um, but they become smaller when we have iron deficient anemia. Polycythemia is an increase in the number of red blood cells. So it could be relative, meaning we have loss of fluid from the blood or dehydration, which will lead to hemoconcentration. Um, so we have more red blood cells than there is fluid uh, relative to the fluid within the blood. So vomiting, diarrhea, profuse sweating, or not drinking will cause this dehydration. Uh, compensatory polycythemia will, can relieve results, which will stimulate the bone marrow to make more blood cells. So at high altitudes, or if we have congestive heart failure, or greyhounds actually have this naturally. They have polycythemia naturally. Um, and it's a normal finding in greyhounds. They don't have problems with it. Uh, there's also polycythemia rubra vera, which is a rare, rare bone marrow disorder, disorder that we don't know the cause of. It's an idiopathic cause. Platelets or thrombocytes, these are not complete cells. They are just pieces of cytoplasm from megakaryocytes. They can be removed when they're old or damaged, and they're removed by macrophages. Uh, platelets are formed through thrombopoiesis, so the stimulation of making thrombocytes or platelets. The parent cell is, again, that multinucleated megakaryocyte, and it stays within the bone marrow and just sends out chunks of cytoplasm, which are the platelets. It undergoes an incomplete mitosis. Um, it doubles the nuclei, but not the cytoplasm. Platelets are round and have lots of small purple granules in the cytoplasm, which contain some clotting factors in calcium to help the form that clot. They're usually smaller than red blood cells. Occasionally, you will see giant platelets that are more physiologically active than smaller platelets. And there are um, dogs that can have this condition of uh, mega um, thrombo 
cytosis um, where they're just giant platelets and it's not actually a problem, it does not cause a problem with uh, clotting, they're actually better at clotting. Function of platelets or thrombocytes is hemostasis, the maintenance of vascular integrity by nurturing endothelial cells that line the vessel. Um, they put out a growth factor that will heal those vessel walls um, periodically. If it's not present in adequate numbers, then red blood cells will migrate through those holy endothelial walls, and that's when you will see petechia throughout the body. Petechia are these little pinpoint uh, bruising or uh, red dots, and that's just red blood cells migrating out of the vascular system. Uh, the platelet plug formation happens if you have a, the lining of the vessel wall is damaged, um, and that can happen uh, periodically uh, throughout uh, the um, uh, throughout the um, life of the animal. Um, so platelets are attracted and adhere irreversibly to it and then to each other uh, using pseudopods. And as they squeeze together, that squeezing releases platelet factors that continue the clotting practice and that clotting cascade, which if you haven't looked yet, you should go back and look at table 9-1 in your book, have that open so you can see what's happening here. Stabilization of the hemostatic plug contributes to fibrin formation, and fibrin is that very start of scar tissue. Uh, the clotting cascade, which again are 13 frat factors, produces thrombin. Thrombin collects on the platelet surface and causes sol soluble fibrinogen um, to make insoluble fibrin strands, and that creates a mesh that stabilizes the clot. Fibrinolysis will remove the clot when the endothelium is healed, so that, that uh, fibrinogen creates a Band-Aid and eventually that Band-Aid or mesh is not needed anymore because we have a complete healing of that vessel. And so once that happens, then we want to remove that clot because if we leave that clot there, that's going to create a problem um, within that blood vessel. It'll start to um, close up that blood vessel. So there are white blood cells as well. We call them leukocytes. And these are any nucleated cell that are normally found in blood. There are five different types, and you'll get to know these very well. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. So neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, we remember those are filled with granules. So they're all fills filled with granules. There are uh, three classifications, um, and they're based on either the type of the defense function, the shape of the nucleus, or the presence or absence of specifically staining cytoplasmic granules. The type of defense function, phagocytosis, phagocytosis, which is eating of uh, uh, foreign material, occurs with the neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes. Uh, antibody production and cellular immunity, that's the lymphocytes. The shape of the nucleus, polymorphonuclear lobed segmented nucleuses you find in uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Mononuclear you'll find in lymphocytes and pleomorphic nucleus, uh, varying shapes that are non-segmented are found in monocytes. Um, the, here is the, where the, the fill comes in, the this presence of these granules. Um, granulocytes are filled with these granules. That's the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Agranulocytes, they have no cytoplasmic granules. Those are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Formation, or leukopoiesis, they all come from that same pluripotent stem, um, stem cell. It, there's a stimuli that acts on this PPSC that determines the outcome, what is made from this PPSC. All of these develop in the bone marrow except for some lymphocytes. They start in the bone marrow, but they actually develop elsewhere. The function uh, is to defend the body against invaders, and each has its own role. Just like the Army has specialists or di different groups of people that, are, that specialize in artillery or uh, aviation or um, uh, medical, each one of these um, white blood cells has its own role. Most of the jobs are done in the tissue using peripheral blood to travel, so the, the peripheral blood is, is transporting them. There's a constant flow of white blood cells out of the marrow into the tissues all day, 
every day. Granulocytes. We're going to talk about the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. They're named for the color of the granules in the cytoplasm. Um, eosinophils pick up the acidic stain, so they're red. Basophils pick up the basic stain, so they're blue. And neutrophils have relatively no stain, so they're colorless or kind of a purple color because red and blue make purple. The general formation is called granulopoiesis. And when they're first formed, you actually can't distinguish the granules. So young um, white cells, you can't distinguish what they're going to turn into. Uh, these granules are produced by the Golgi apparatus, and they're nonspecific. And they're gradually replaced by specific granules. Neutrophil granules contain lysosomal enzymes, so they kill microorganisms that the neutrophils engulf. And neutrophils are the first line of defense in our immune system. Immature granulocytes have metabolically active cytoplasm, so they stain blue, and they also have relatively round and smooth nuclei, but they can be somewhat segmented. As granulocytes mature, the nuclei transforms into shapes containing thin filaments, and they begin shrinking and twisting. And eventually, those nuclei will become pycnotic and the cell will die. So you can tell a young neutrophil by looking at its nucleus. If it's looks like a band or a hair band, it's called a banded neutrophil, neutrophil because it hasn't twisted and segmented quite, um, quite enough yet. As it gets older, it will get in, uh, more segmented until it completely twists in a knot and becomes too old to do its job. Neutrophils are considered polymorphonuclear and um, they also have segmented uh, nuclei. So we have PMNs and uh, segmented. Um, they, are most, they are the most numerous cell that we find in dogs, cats, and horses. Uh, the formation is in the bone marrow, and they go to the blood as needed, and it takes three to six days to make a mature neutrophil. A mature neutrophil uh, has uh, more segments and eventually leads to the point of pycnosis and cell death. An immature neutrophil has no segments, so like I said, it's called a, a, a band, a neutrophil. So think of a little kid with a headband. Um, and here's a picture of that neutrophil um, uh, slowly maturing. The function of uh, the neutrophil is to phagocytize um, because they have those granules containing the digestive enzymes, enzymes called lysosomes. Neutrophils spend 10 hours in blood prior to entering the tissue, but a shorter time if the there's an increase in demand. All circulating neutrophils need to be replaced two and a half times a day. So our our marrow is just constantly making and replacing. Dead neutrophils are eaten by macrophages in the tissue. Neutrophils, how do they know where to go? They go to the site of infection um, by chemotaxis, following the chemical trail. Um, and then they're led to individual microorganisms. Some microorganisms can hide in a capsule. And this capsule is coated with opsinins, op sonins, which contain antibodies, and that will help the neutrophil to recognize the organism as an invader. So here is a picture demonstrating what the neutrophil will do when it recognizes organisms. It will gather it into its own cytoplasm, make a little packet of it, these lysosomes surround it, and uh, eat it up until it's broken apart. So the coding process is called opsonization. Those in, engulfed microorganisms are contained within a vacuole. The neutrophils increase the metabolism of oxygen when ingesting microorganisms to produce substances that are toxic to ingest that bacteria. So hydrogen peroxide is actually a product of oxygen metabolism, and it's bactericidal. That's why hydrogen peroxide, when you put it on something that has uh, bacteria, will bubble. Um, Hydrogen peroxide affects the enhanced or affects are enhanced by the enzyme myeloperoxidase, which is released from those granules, and lysosomes will uh, from those granules will break down the cell walls, break those bacteria apart. The counts in the blood are kept within a certain range. So when we do a blood test, we should see the neutrophils lie within this certain range when we have a healthy animal. The release of mature neutrophils from a storage pool in the marrow into the peripheral blood is usually about a five-day supply, and the changes happen almost instantly. The rate of escape from peripheral blood into the tissue depends on the need in the tissue if there's infection, um, and the changes can be seen within hours. Entrance of increased numbers of the stem cells into neutrophil production line 
um, will happen if we uh, if we have a, a need for them. And again, it takes three to six days to mature. Um, so we, we can see some slower uh, changes in that. Um, intravascular pool of neutrophils, there is a circulating pool in the center lumen of the vessel, and those are where the normal ranges are based. There is also a marginal pool where, which line the small blood vessel walls of the spleen, lungs, and abdominal organs. We don't see those numbers in lab samples. All right, moving on to eosinophils. Um, eosinophils, again, have these red acid-staining granules in the cytoplasm. They make about 0 to 5% of our total white blood cell count, so you sometimes don't see any of these. They are produced in the marrow, and it takes two to six days to produce a mature uh, eosinophil from a PPSC. There are different shapes depending on the species. So if you look at our picture here, you can see the canine, the feline, the equine, and the bovine, and the greyhound, which is not a different species, but they do have slightly different um, cells uh, within their blood system. And it's probably due to the fact that they are racing dogs uh, and they just have a different uh, makeup. The function is determined by the granules. So uh, chemotaxis will, or a chemistry, a chemical um, signal will bring the eosinophils into the tissues. We normally find eosinophils in skin, lung, and small intestinal tissues. They have three main functions. So anti-inflammatory, they inhibit local allergic and anaphylactic reactions. They also help with immunity. They do ingest substances with a humoral immune response. And that means that we have an antigen antibody complex that they recognize. And then just plain old phagocytosis, um, they do have a minimal uh, phagocytotic bactericidal, um, mostly with protozoa and parasitic worms. So when do we see them? Allergic responses and parasites. So we may see an increase in eosinophils, like I said, with allergic reactions and parasitic infections. Um, we'll see an increased release of mature eosinophils from the storage pool into the marrow and a migration of eosinophils from that marginal pool into the bloodstream. So that increased production in the marrow and increased time in the peripheral blood will lead to an increased count or eosinophilia. Eosinopenia, it's hard to tell because they're normally pretty low, but uh, if this is a dog that you normally have a higher of like a 5% range and you're seeing 0%, you could call that an eosinopenia. Basophils are the white blood cell that we least often see. They, their granules are water soluble, so they're frequently washed out and they're just not always visible. Basophils and tissue mast cells have the same characteristics. Basophils, though, are seen in the blood but not in the tissue. Mast cells are seen in the tissue but not in the blood. So you might think because they're not seen in the same place that they may be the same cell, but they're not. Uh, they, are, they come from slightly different um, uh, origins. Mast cells are larger. The granules are not water-soluble, and they have a round nucleus with no segmentation. The function is that they are phagocytic, but they are the least phagocytic of all the granulocytes. Their granules contain histamine and heparin. So they initiate inflammation and acute allergic reactions, and they attract eosinophils with something called an eosinophilic chemotactic factor. So basophils will come in first and say, hey, buddy, eosinophil, I need your help. Um, they, heparin will act as a localized anticoagulant to keep blood flowing to the area so that neutrophils, eosinophils, and eventually lymphocytes will come to the area. All right, let's talk about agranulocytes. Agranulocytes are monocytes and macrophages, and they don't really have granules in their cytoplasm that we can see very well. Um, together, we call them the mononuclear phagocyte system, or MPS. Monocytes occur in the uh, blood and macrophages you find in the tissue. And so macrophages are monocytes that have moved into the tissue. Five to six percent uh, of these monocytes are formed um, from the stem cells every 24 to 36 hours. They stay in the blood longer than neutrophils. Uh, they have a pleomorphic nucleus that is not segmented. 
Um, if they do move into the tissue, they're called macrophages, and they're prevalent in filter organs like the liver, the spleen, the lung, and the lymph nodes. They follow neutrophils around uh, into the tissue and through chemotaxis, and they stay around longer than the neutrophils in order to clean up. They are the major phagocytic cells, uh, macrophages even more so than monocytes. They clean up cellular debris after an inflammation or infection uh, clears up. The process, uh, they process certain antigens, making them more antigenic. They ingest antigens and present them on their cell membranes for lymphocytes to destroy. And they ingest foreign substances. So they are the major cleanup cells. The other agranule sites are lymphocytes, and they are the predominant white blood cell that we find in ruminants and pigs. They do not have any phagocytic capabilities, so you may be wondering, why do we have them? They live in lymphoid tissues and lymphatic vessels and blood vessels, and they recirculate in between the blood uh, cells, uh, the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels. Uh, they are made from stem cells within the marrow, but before they mature, some of these cells actually leave the marrow and develop in other central lymphoid organs before um, they settle into their per, uh, permanent home in the peripheral lymphoid tissue. What do they do? Well, there are different types of lymphocytes and they have different functions. T lymphocytes or T cells are the, the lymphocytes that we find in the blood they are processed in the thymus. So thym T cells are processed in the thymus. Pre-T cells are um, called thymocytes in the thymus, and they come from the bone marrow to the, thymocyte, uh, the thymus. These thymocytes mature rapidly and leave the thymus to travel to specific T-dependent zones in, the no in nodes and in the spleen, lymph nodes and spleen. They are responsi responsible for cell-mediated immunity and for activating B cells. So T cells go to college in the thymus to learn exactly what they are responsible for in the body. B cells or B lymphocytes are uh, called B cells because they are bursa equivalent cells. They're found in the bone marrow and other lymphoid tissue that is equivalent to the bursa of Fabricius in birds. So, B cells were uh, probably uh, first identified in birds as far as their or origin, and so that's why they're called bursa equivalent cells. The inactive B cells travel through lymph nodes, the spleen, and other lymphoid structures, but rarely circulate in peripheral blood. So what do we see in peripheral blood? We see T cells, the T lymphocytes. These guys are responsible for antibody production. Each B cell is pre-programmed to produce only one specific antibody type against one specific antigen or foreign protein. So these B cells are highly specific. So here's a picture, uh, it uh, occurs in your book, figure 9-7 uh, of your book. Um, this blue structure is an antigen and each of these blue structures is a different antigen specific for a different protein or a different foreign substance. This epitope is on the surface of this antigen, and it fits like a pu puzzle piece into very specific antibodies. So here you can see the puzzle piece of the antigen, specific antigen, fitting into the specific antibody. The antigen antibody complex is when these two things fit together. That antibody on the B cell surface is, is specific for this very specific antigen, and it has that unique shape um, because of that epitope that is found on the surface of these antigens. That um, a B cell has that complementary combining site when they're uh, joined. Um, it's the antigen antibody. Say it real quickly and it's one word. The B cells are pre-programmed to receive only one thing, kind of like just canine distemper. No other B cell will be involved. Even if they're never exposed to the disease, they can have antibodies to that disease. When they recognize that antigen, they can transform into plasma cells that release antibodies. Plasma cells are derived from antigen-stimulated B cells through blastic transformation. They produce, store, and release antibodies, or immunoglobulins. Uh, they're found anywhere in the T 
tissue, but large numbers are found in the lymph nodes and in the spleen, and they are rarely in the blood. So plasma cells are B cells that have been derived from antigen stimulated uh, antigen uh, stimulation. Um, so they're lymphocytes that live in the tissue that are ready to go. There are cells called natural killer cells, and here is an actual picture of a natural killer cell going after a target. And uh, this looks like a monster, and it, it really is. They are not B or T cells, and they're not activated by a specific antigen. They have the ability to kill some types of tumor cells and cells infected with various viruses. Lymphocytes are classified as either large or small. When they're large, they have more cytoplasm, and that means they're younger. There are no granules in the cytoplasm. They have a round nucleus and no segmentation. So here's what we see. We can tell this is in, uh, from the blood because we have lots of little red blood cells around these lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes are slightly bigger than, than the, the red blood cells that surround them. Memory cells, um, both B, T and B cells can become memory cells. They are clones of the original lymphocyte. They don't participate in the original immune response to a specific antigen. They survive in the lymphoid tissue for the next exposure for the same antigen. So they can respond more quickly with a bigger response the second time. So memory cells are formed after there's an original uh, infection. And then they hang around for a while waiting for the next time. When do we see increases and decreases, decreases in lymphocytes? Well. With lymphocytosis, we see an increased number of lymphocytes in the peripheral blood from leukemia. So that's an abnormal mitosis that is occurring due to a, a cancer. Chronic infections, epinephrine release with fight or flight. So we have a, a stress response. Um, and lymphocytosis can cause an overall leukocytosis, so white blood cells. So any one of the strain of white blood cells, if they are really increased in number, will cause an overall white blood cell count to rise. How do we see less numbers, lymphocytopenia or leukopenia? When we have decreased production of lymphocytes, the presence of corticosteroids or steroids can decrease. This is what we call an immunosuppressant dose of steroids. Certain immunodeficiency disease, acute viral diseases will cause a severe decrease uh, in um, lymphocytes. And that's just part of the way the virus survives. It, it shuts down the immune system. And then lymphopenia. Um, can result in leukopenia, especially in ruminants, because remember, it's their predominant um, uh, white blood cell. All right, let's talk about the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a series of vessels or ducts that carries excess tissue fluid to blood vessels near the heart, where the fluid is put back into the bloodstream. This includes lymph tissue throughout the body in structures like the lymph nodes, the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, and then GALT, the gut-associated lymph tissue, which is all throughout the intestines. Fluid in the system is called lymph. Lymphocytes, and, and it, is, it contains the following, lymphocytes and a few other blood cells, nutrients, fats and proteins, hormones, anything that entered tissue fluid with the plasma, T cells, which travel back and forth between the lymph and the blood, and B cells, which are usually found just in the lymph tissue. Lymph circulation um, is when we have lymph starting as excess tissue fluid picked up by the small lymph capillaries. And these are lymph vessels, um, go to lymph vessels, which are go through the lymph nodes, through the thoracic duct, which is near the heart, into the blood capillaries, and then they're removed from the body through the kidney as needed. Edema will occur if there's too much fluid to be removed. Now, when we look at um, lymph tissues or lymph capillaries versus um, arteries, capillaries, and uh, veins, now arteries will connect directly with other vessels, with veins, through a blood capillary. Lymph capillaries have a dead end. So there is a, a process through which lymph can get stuck in this dead end, and that's where we get swelling of tissue and edema. 
Characteristics uh, of lymph, when lymph reaches the thoracic duct, it is transparent or translucent and contains some cells, but um, those are primarily lymphocytes. Um, it has more water, sugar, and electrolytes than plasma, um, and it will have larger molecules, or the plasma will have the larger molecules like the albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. So plasma, uh, having those larger molecules will have an increased pressure versus the lymph. Lymph from the digestive system is called chyle, and after a meal, that chyle contains chylomicrons, which cause the lymph to appear white or pale, yellow, and cloudy, and can appear in blood and cause a postprandial lipemia. So that's what we'll see when we have a, uh, an animal who has just had especially a high fatty meal. Uh, when we take blood from them, they have a very uh, milky color to their um, blood and to their serum. The lymphoid tissue system um, is comprised of bone marrow, central lymphoid organs, peripheral lymphoid organs. Bone marrow is where we have the stem cells that produce lymphocytes. The central lymphoid organ organs are where immature lymphocytes are processed, and that includes the thymus, the bone marrow, and the uh, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And when we talk about the lympho lymphocytes um, processing, we're talking about putting it into those different cell lines like T cells or B cells. Peripherid, peripheral lymphoid orga, organs are where mature lymphocytes live, and they live in the lymph nodes, the tonsils, the bone marrow, galt, uh, spleen, and thymus. The lymph system has four primary functions. Removal of excess tissue fluid, and remember what it's what happens when we have excess tissue fluid and it's not removed from the lymph through the lymph system. We have edema, waste material transport, filtration of lymph, and protein transport. So here are the structures in the lymph system. The lymph nodes. These are small kidney bean shaped stru structures all along the lymph vessels. They have a cortex and a medulla, and they are contained within a a connective tissue capsule. Um, they add lymphocytes into the lymph. Tissue macrophages within uh, will filter out microorganisms or other foreign matter like cancer cells in order to spread the uh, limit the spread of disease, but they uh, disease can and cancer can overwhelm them. In the spleen, there's both lymphatic and hematologic functions. It's a fairly large tongue-shaped organ. Remember, it's on the left side of the abdomen near the stomach or near the rumen. It is the largest lymphoid organ. It is covered with a capsule and made up of fibrous connective tissue, or the capsule is made up of fiber, fibrous connective tissue and smooth muscle. That smooth muscle contracts to squeeze the blood out and into the circulation. Remember, it's like a sponge. And the interior has a red pulp. There are blood vessels and tissue macrophages and blood sinuses within. Um, there's also a white pulp in which there is lymphoid tissue in which the lymphocytes can actually clone themselves. The functions of the spleen are to store blood in that red pulp, to remove foreign material and dead, dying, and abnormal red blood cells from the circulation. Also, um, there, because there are tissue macrophages within that red pulp that will do that. And also, um, it has the, the capability of, of with the red pulp that those lymphocytes are cloning um, during an immune response. So they're making more white cells. The thymus, the location of the thymus is within the caudal neck and cranial thoracic area on either side of the trachea. It's most prominent in young animals, but then it shrinks as the animal matures. So in young animals, it's really important um, because this is where the thymocytes are processed and uh, the T cells basically going to college. They're learning what uh, diseases they need to be looking out for and, and what, um, what cells within this animal's body are normal cells and which uh, cells within this body are abnormal, maybe abnormal cells. So once these thymocytes are processed, um, these T cells are uh, will leave in, able, uh, in order to be distributed throughout the peripheral lymphoid tissues. And this is where um, the thymus kickstarts the normal development of the immune system. Tonsils. Um, these are nodules of lymph tissue that are actually not covered, covered by the body. 
they are actually found in epithelial surfaces all over the body, but we're familiar with the tonsils that we can see in the pharynx. We can see those and uh, got this picture of these tonsils in the back of the throat. You can actually see little white um, plaques on these tonsils. Um, mature lymphocytes live within tonsils and they're most prominent in young animals with a developing immune system. No, um, these are not considered lymphoid uh, lymph nodes because tonsils are found very close to that moist epithelial or mucosal surfaces. They don't have a capsule. They're found at the beginning of the lymph drainage system, not along the vessels. And they're found in the pharynx, larynx, intestine, prepuce, and vagina. So they are the, the, the sentinels of the immune system. They are the first thing that disease will generally come across or foreign material will come um, uh, across before entering the lymph system. The gut associated lymph system is the general term for lymphoid tissue found in lining of the intestine. More than 25% of intestinal mucosa and submucosa um, is incorporated in this gut associated lymph tissue. It is the largest lymphoid tissue in the body. We compare it to the bursa of Fabricius in birds. Uh, it is a central lymphoid tissue, and this is where B lymphocytes are processed before going to peripheral lymphoid tissue. Also, uh, it is considered peripheral lymphoid tissue um, because mature lymphocytes are contained within it. The function of the immune system. It protects the animal from anything that could cause damage or disease. It re recognizes what is self and what is not self. Uh, phagocytosis and destruction of foreign cells. It lyses foreign cell membranes. It inactivates the pathogenic uh, organisms or chemical substances and it precipitates or clumps, we call that agglutination, of um, it, cells or molecules that are abnormal. Occasionally, it can go beyond protection and result in massive tissue damage if we have an immune-mediated disease or anaphylaxis. There are two types of immune reactions that we'll describe, and that's the nonspecific immunity and the specific immunity. Nonspecific immunity is a rapid response to foreign invaders. These are things that are not self. Uh, they involve tissues, cells, and processes, um, and they are the first line of defense. Um, it is, uh, we have a protective barrier, and it can be mechanical or chemical. So the mechanical is skin or mucosa. Chemical is, hydro, uh, for instance, um, hydrochloric acid in the, in the stomach. Uh, increased acidic environment within the vagina is another example of that. The second line of defense is our inflammatory response. Um, these are uh, chemical mediators like histamine and other chemotactic substances. Um, phagocytosis, which is where our phagocytic cells will come and eat foreign material. We have our natural killer cells, which are not uh, T cells or B cells. Um, and we have interferon and complement, which we will also describe. Interferon is a protein uh, which is produced by a cell after it has been infected by a virus. Interferon responds rapidly to inhibit further development and spread of that virus. Complement in inactivates enzymes in plasma. Uh, it is activated by attachment of antibody to antigen, leading to a cascade of the activation of all enzymes. And this is called complement fixation. Molecules that are formed then arrange themselves into a donut shape on, on the antigen surface, creating a hole in the cell which allows sodium and water to enter and it bursts that cell open. So interferon and complement help to uh, kill invading cells. The third line of defense is specific immunity. Specific immunity is primarily due to lymphocytes, but it could be activated by other cells. It is the third line of a defense, and there are unique reactions which uh, destroy antigens with B cells, either through antibody formation or directing other cells to attach the antigen. T cells, uh, uh, it also creates reactions for the T cells to attack, attack these foreign objects directly. Uh, specific immunity is in response to a specific antigen, and it's initiated as a reaction to the epitope on the invading cell. 
there are two types of a specific immunity, cell-mediated and humoral immunity. But there are three specific properties regardless of type. They are the response initiated after an antigen enters the body, response aimed specifically against the antigen present, and if the antigen enters again, then the memory will increase the response rate and the force of response. Humoral immunity is uh, antigen antibody complex, uh, which activates the B cell. Um, once the antigen antibody complex activates the B cell, the B cell divides many times and it transforms into plasma cells, which make more antibody molecules. Those plasma cells, which are in the lymphoid tissue, secrete, secrete these antibodies into the plasma instead of placing on the membrane, and those antibodies uh, circulate and destroy those antigens. The antibody antigen co um, complex can have several effects. Antigens in the form of toxins that destroy cells, and so they make those cells harmless, or the antigens are clumped together for macrophages to ingest, or the antibody can activate complement system, which, uh, as we know, ruptures the membrane of the antigen. Um, but we have to remember that as this B cell divides many times, sometimes these B cells aren't secreted um, and go, go become plasma cells. They actually become memory cells, so that later when we have this foreign um, uh, invasion again, those B cells can remember this much more quickly and mount a, a bigger response. So what are these antibodies? These are also called immunoglobulins, and there are five different types that are recognized. Immunoglobulin G, M, A, E, and D. Immunoglobulin G is made during the first exposure to an antigen, and it's the first immunoglobulin that is made by newborns. There is a slow production of these so the animal may be sick before an immune response can occur to that, can conquer that antigen. Immunoglobulin M is made after there's been a long exposure to an antigen or it's the second exposure to an antigen. So it takes a little bit longer for this um, immunoglobulin M to be made, but there's a more rapid production of this so the antigen may be conquered before the animal even sickens. Immunoglobulin A can go into the tissue and it prevents the disease caused by antigens that enter in the body through mucosal surfaces, um, such as the intestinal tract and the lungs. Now, here's a good example of using this immunoglobulin A. Bordetella vaccine given intranasally or in, uh, intraorally um, stimulates the production of immunoglobulin A. And so it prevents the disease right where the disease might come into the body, through in the intestinal tract or through the lungs. IgE, or immunoglobulin E, is associated with allergic responses, and we have no idea what immunoglobulin D does. But that may be changing in the next few years. Memory cells. Memory cells are, can be T cells or it could be B cells, and they are activated uh, to clone themselves, and those clones will go out and into the tissue um, uh, most of the clones go out into the tissue and become involved in the respo response. But if they don't, they become memory cells. And they circulate in the blood or stay in the lymph nodes and uh, for a little bit longer, and they just wait for that antigen to try to come back um, so that they can create a, a bigger response. Um, some of them live for days, and others can live for years. Some examples of uh, some differences between those um, vaccines that we use to create these diseases and create these memory cells, some vaccines last longer than others. For instance, a Bordetella vaccine, we say, can last for up to six months. That means that our memory cells aren't living very long, um, whereas rabies can live for years. Our memory cells for rabies will live for much longer than those for Bordetella. Immunization um, is against disease. There is passive immunity and active immunity. Passive immunity simply refers to administering those preformed antibodies. We get the antibodies from someplace else and put it into the other animal, into the animal's immune system. We can get that transplacentally. Um, the fetus gets it from the mother, uh, either through the placenta or through the, um, the baby through the colostrum of the uh, first milk. Uh, antibodies can be taken from another animal's immune system through a blood transfusion 
or the tetanus antitoxin is made by hyper immunizing an animal and then um, taking the serum from that and taking those antibodies. Active immunity is um, through a, it's a natural response to the antigen. So it can happen through exposure to the antigen. Um, then we have those memory cells that are produced. Um, that's a slow production, but it can uh, help to um, uh, be effective the second time. If we have a healthy immune system, it can be effective the second time the animal or the person comes into contact with that disease. We can also get active immunity through immunization or vaccination, through killed antigens, weakened or attenuated antigens, antigens that don't look exactly like the disease. Uh, so the epitopes are intact, but the, um, the, the antigen is actually not able to cause the disease or not as much of a disease. Um, it, with immunization, often we need to do boosters in order to make sure that the animal's immune system remembers this disease. So that's a lot of information, um, some really cool stuff happening within your blood and your bone and your, your lymph tissues right now. Um, I want you to think about it, go back through, um, finish up your, your um, review questions and bring those to class. If you have any further questions, we'll go over those.